Um, I'm going to be reading Laura Hildebrand's uh, book, Chapter 8. I don't normally do uh, readings of this book at this time. Um, however, um, I noticed today is Sunday, and uh, the normal um, uh, trouble that comes from over there, they're actually in the middle of a um, heated debate with somebody else. So I'm using that occasion to try to get a chapter in here. So I'm going to be curt because uh, I want to do it before um, more chaos ensues next door, the crazy neighbors in this ghetto apartment complex I live in in Honolulu, Hawaii. Okay, chapter 8. Only the laundry knew how scared I was. It was early morning on January 8th, 1943. The sun hadn't yet risen. George Mosnett and Jer James Carringer, who had spent New Year's Eve with Louis, joined the crew at the beachside airstrip at Barker Sands on Kauai, preparing to lead a three-plane training run over Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is a couple miles from where I'm at right now. The pilot was Major Jonathan Coxwell, one of the Phil's closest friends. As he taxied out for his flight, Coxwell tried to reach the control tower, but the tower's radio was down. He powered his plane down the runway, lifted off, and flew over the beach into the darkness. The two other planes took off after Coxwell. Later that morning, they returned. Coxwell's plane did not. No one had seen it since takeoff. During a briefing at 8, Louis was told that Coxwell's plane was missing. Phil's crew was slated for practice bombing off Barking Sands that morning, so they went early and walked the beach, looking for some sign of their friends. Someone found a $400 paycheck that was washed ashore. It made out to Ma's net. The Superman crew was 15,000 feet up when the lost B-24 was found, lying on the ocean floor not far offshore. All 10 crewmen were dead. Coxwell had bar barely made it past takeoff. He had cleared the runway, turned, and slammed into the water. Several crewmen had survived the trash and tried to swim to land, but sharks had found them. The men were, Louis wrote in his diary, literally ripped to pieces. Five, including Ma's net, had lived in the pornographic palace with Louis and Phil. Carringer had just been promoted to first lieutenant, but had died before anyone could tell him. They were buried in the cemetery in Honolulu, joining the men killed at Pearl Harbor. Wow, that must have been a scary sight. Their plane goes down, a few men survive it and try to swim ashore, but the sharks are like, <laughs> people go swimming over there all the time, it's full of sharks. Louis was shaken. He'd been in Hawaii for only two months, yet already several dozen men from his bomb group, including more of a quarter of the men in his barracks, had been killed. The first loss had come on a flight from San Francisco when a B-24 had simply vanished. This fate was sadly common between 1943 and 1945. 400 AAF crews were lost en route to their theaters. Next, a plane had caught fire and crashed in Kahuku, killing four men. Another plane had hit a mountain. A bomber had been forced down. After losing all four engines, killing two, and one bomber, a green engine transferring fuel across the wings had got, caused gasoline to pool on the floor of the bomb bay. When the bomb bay doors had scraped open, igniting a spark, the plane exploded. Three men had survived, including a passenger whose hand had happened to be resting on a parachute when the blast flung him from the plane. After the wake raid, a plane sent to photograph the damage had been hit by anti-aircraft fire. The crew had sent out a last message, can't make it, and was never heard from again. Then had come Coxwell's crash. So they had a lot of losses on the island of Hawaii. Um, I've lived here for five, on the island of Hawaii, on the, in the state of Hawaii, on the island of Oahu and Kauai. I'm on the island of Oahu, I've been here for five years. And one of the thing, first things I noticed from moving from the mainland is when you look up, you see all these like military planes, like Air Force is a big, um, big uh, presence on the island. And you see them walk around, they kind of stand out. They're paid, they're known to be paid really well and they're pretty wealthy, but you know, it's, it's, there's a dichotomy and a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, I'm not sure. But um, uh, the, the planes in the sky, you notice like, uh, you, I've never seen these planes only on TV before, but you see like the B-24 bombers and the F-16s or whatever, and you're like, whoa. And they're like flying to light speed. It's not uncommon to hear a sound boom here when something breaks the sound barrier. But back to the, uh, the uh, war the, uh, the book here. As planes went, so went the men. In the Air Corps, 35,000 personnel died in non-battle situations, the vast majority of them in accidental crashes. Even in combat, airmen appeared to have more likely to die from accidents than in combat itself. A report issued by the AAF Surgeon General suggests that in the 50th Air Force between November 1st, 1943 and May 25th, 1945, 70% of men listed as killed in action died in operational Air Force aircraft accidents, not a result of enemy action. 
In many cases, the problem was the planes, in part because they were new technology and in part because they were used so heavily. Planes were prone to breakdowns. In January 1943 alone, Louis recorded in his diary 10 serious mechanical problems in Superman and other planes in which he flew, including two in-flight engine failures, a gas leak, oil pressure problems, and landing gear that locked, fortunately, in the down position. <laughs> Once, Superman's brakes failed on landing. By the time Phil got the plane stopped, the bomber was three feet short of the runway's end. Just beyond it lay the ocean. The weather also took a toll. Storms reduced visibility to zero, a major problem for pilots searching for tiny islands or threading through the mountains that flank some Hawaiian runways. Uh, you know, this is Hawaii. We have some of the largest mountains in the world on these islands. B-24s were hard to manage, even in smooth skies. In some tropical tempests, not even the combined strength of pilot and co-pilot could keep their plane in hand. Twice in one week, Superman flew into storms that buffeted the plane so violently that Phil lost control. Once, the plane was flung around for the sky for 10 minutes, leaving the temporary co-pilot so paralyzed with fear that Phil had to call Louie to take his place. Um, another thing I noticed about this uh, the island of Hawaii, the storms here, they're massive. I've seen the most rain have been a lot of places and more rain like monsoon rains that come here and uh, the wind is stronger here than anywhere else and uh, the mountains like i said they're huge one of the first things i see when looking at them like i'm surprised planes haven't crashed into them and apparently planes have crashed into them one day after sea search as phil was detouring around the squall cupernell asked him if he dare fly into it i can fly this thing anywhere phil said turning the plane into the storm Superman was instantly swallowed, and Phil could see nothing. Rain drummed on the plane, wind pivoted it sideways, and began porpoising, leaving the crewmen clinging to anything bolted down. They had only been at 1,000 feet when they flown into the storm. Now the plane was pitching so erratically that they couldn't read their altitude, and, wished no visibility, and with no visibility, they didn't know where the ocean was. That's dangerous. Each time the plane plunged, the, the men braced for a crash. Oahu had been in the sight they entered the storm, but they now had no idea where it was. Phil grappled the yoke, sweat streaming from his face, Pillsbury strapped on his parachute. Riding the bucking plane on his radio table, Harry Brooks, Brooks picked up a signal from a Hawaiian radio station. The plane was equipped with a radio compass that enabled Harry to determine the direction from which the signal was coming. Phil strong-armed the plane around and headed toward it. They broke out of the storm, found the airfield, and landed. Phil was exhausted, his shirt wringing wet. The runways were another headache. Many islands were so short that engineers had to plow coral onto one end to create enough length for a runway. Even with the amendments, there often wasn't enough space. After long missions, groups of planes occasionally came back so low on fuel that none of them could wait for the others to land, so they'd land simultaneously with the lead pilot delaying his touchdown until he was far enough down the runway for the planes behind him to land at the same time. So many planes shot off the end of Funafuti runway into the ocean that the ground crews kept a bulldozer equipped with a towering cable parked by the water. For loaded B-24s, which needed well over 4,000 feet for takeoff, the cropped island runways, often abuted by towering palm trees, were a challenge. The takeoff proved exciting, wrote Staff Sergeant Frank Rosenek over one overloaded departure. Six of us had to stand on the narrow beam between the bomb bay doors with our arms spread out on each side over the tops of the twin auxiliary fuel tanks. The smell of the high-octane aviation fuel was almost intoxicating. The plane lumbered down the runway for an eternity until we could see the hard-packed coral through the cracks where the bomb bay doors came up against the beam we were standing on, one foot in front of the other. There was a swoosh, and pieces of palm fronds suddenly appeared, jammed in the cracks on both sides. Only the laundry knew how scared I was. And then there were a human air. Pilots flew or drove their planes into each other. In B-24s, notorious for fuel leaks, airmen lit cigarettes and blew up their planes. On one flight, when Superman's number three engine died, Pillsbury found the temporary co-pilot, oblivious, sitting with his boot resting against the engine's ignition switch, pushing it into the off position. Louis was once asked to join a crew whose bombarder had gotten sick. Louis, too, was feeling ill, so the crew found another man. During the flight, the tower warned the pilot that he was heading toward a mountain. The pilot replied that he saw it, then flew right into it. The strangest incident occurred when a bomber made a sharp pull up on a training run. A man inside, trying to avoid falling, inadvertently grabbed the left raft release handle. The raft sprang from the roof and wrapped around the plane's horizontal stabilizer. Barely able to control the plane, the pilot ordered his men to bail out. He and his co-pilot somehow landed safely, and everyone survived. Well, that one ended good, I guess. <laughs>
Finally, there was the formidable difficulty of navigation, making extraordinarily complex spherical trigonometry calculations based on figures taken from a crowd of instruments. Navigators groped over thousands of miles of featureless ocean toward targets and destination islands that were blacked out at night, often only yards wide and flat on the horizon. Even with all the instruments, the procedures could be comically primitive. Each time I made a sextant cap calibration, wrote navigator John Willard, I would escape the hatch of the flight desk and stand on the navigation desk and the radio's upper desk while the radio man held onto my legs so I wouldn't be sucked out of the plane. At night, navigators sometimes resorted to following the stars, guided their crews over the Pacific by means not so different by those used by ancient Polynesian mariners. In storm or clouds, even that was impossible. Given that a plane had to be a takeoff course to miss an island, it's amazing that any crews found their destinations. Many didn't. Martin Cohen, an ordnance officer on Oahu, was once in a radio shack and lost a plane. Equipped with radar, tried to find the island. We just sat there and watched the plane pass the island and it never came back, he said. I could see it on the radar. It makes you feel terrible. Life was cheap in war. One mistake. The risks of flying were compounded exponentially in combat. From the sky came Japanese fighters, chief among them the Swifts, Agile Zero which dominated the sky in the first half of the war. Zero pilots palmetted bombers with machine gun fire massively destructive 20 millimeter cannon shells, which rammed gaping holes in their targets. When they failed, some Zero pilots rammed their planes into bombers, kamikaze style. One B-24 returned to base with half a Zero hanging from his wing. From the ground came anti-aircraft fire, including flak. which burst into razor-sharp metal shards that sliced planes open. To survive AA fire and enemy aircraft, bomber pilots needed to change their altitude and direction constantly. But on approach, the Norden bomb site, not the pilot, flew the plane, so evasive action was impossible. B-24s were in the control of the bomb site for three to six minutes on approach. Japanese rangefinders needed less than 60 seconds to pinpoint bomber altitude. The math favored the Japanese. In combat, bombers even poised rose risks to one another. To fend off fighter attack and hit narrow target islands, planes had to bunch very close together. In the chaos, planes collided, fired on each other, and worse, in one incident, three B-24s on a mission to mine a harbor flew in tight formation through a narrow canyon at 50 feet under intense ground fire. As they dropped over the harbor, the right wingtip of a plane piloted by Lieutenant Robert Strong struck the greenhouse window on the plane to his right, piloted by Lieutenant Robinson. The collision rotated Strong's bomber onto its left side and under Robinson's planes just as Robinson's bombarder dropped a thousand pound mine. The mine crashed into Strong's plane and though it didn't de detonate, it tore an 18 square foot hole in the fuselage and lodged itself just behind the waste gunners. Strong's B-24 was nearly cut in two and the mine's parachutes deployed, dragging the plane down. Crewmen cut the parachute free and shoved at the mine, but it wouldn't budge, so they dismantled their guns and used the barrels to crowbar the mine out. As Strong tried to get the nearby bisected plane home, the tail flapped in the wind and a huge crack crept up the fuselage. Impossibly, Strong flew his Liberator 800 miles and landed. When Jesse Stay, a pilot, and Louis Scrogen went to see the bomber, he was nearly able to pull its tail off with one hand. The risk of combat created grim statistics. In World War II, 52,173 AAF men were killed in combat. According to Stay, who would, be who would become a squadron commander, airmen trying to fulfill the 40 combat missions that made up a Pacific bomber's crewman tour of duty had a 50% chance of being killed. 50% chance of being killed. Along with safe return, injury, and death, airmen faced another possible fate. During the war, thousands of airmen vanished, some during combat missions, some on routine flights. Many had been swallowed by the ocean, some were alive but lost on the sea or islands, and some had been captured. Unable to find them, the military declared them missing. If they weren't found within 13 months, they were declared dead. There was a lot of uh, people who lost soldiers in World War II on islands scattered around the world, believe it or not. Most of the time, stricken Pacific bombers came down on water, either by ditching or by crashing. Crewmen who crashed were very unlikely to survive, but ditching offered better odds, depending on the bomber. The B-17s and its soon-to-be-introduced cousin, the gigantic B-29s, had wide, wide, low wings that, with the fuselage, formed a relatively flat surface that could surf on the water. Their sturdy bomb bay doors sat flush to the fuselage intended to hold in a ditching, enabling the plane to float. 
The first ditching B-29 not only survived, it floated onto an Indian beach, completely intact the following day. The B-24 was another story. Its wings were narrow and mounted high at the fuselage, and its delicate bomb bay doors protruded slightly from the bottom of the plane. In most B-24 ditchings, the bomb bay doors would catch on the water and tear off and the plane would blow apart. Less than a quarter of ditched B-72s broke apart, but a survey of B-24 ditchings found that nearly two-thirds broke up and a quarter of the crewmen died. For B-24 survivors, quick escape was crucial. Without sealed fuel solage, Liberators sank instantly. One airman recalled watching his ditched B-24 sink so quickly that he could still see its lights when, it's, when it was vast far below the surface. Every airman was given a May West life vest because some men stole the vest's carbon dioxide cartridges for use in carbonating drinks. Some vests didn't inflate. <laughs> life rafts were deployed manually from inside the plane. Crewmen could, crew men could pull a release handle just before ditching or crashing from outside a floating plane. They could climb up on the wings and turn raft release levers. One deployed, once deployed, rafts inflated automatically. Survivors had to get to the rafts immediately. Airmen would later speak of sharks arriving almost the moment their plane struck the water. In 1943, Navy Lieutenant Art Reading, Louis USC track teammate, was knocked unconscious as he ditched his two-man plane. As the plane sank, Reading's navigator, Everett Almond, pulled Reading out, inflated their May West, and lashed himself to Reading. As Reading woke, Almond began towing him toward the nearest island, 20 miles away. Sharks soon be began circling. One swept in, bit down on Almond's leg, and dove, dragging both men deep underwater. Then something gave way, and the men rose to the surface in a pool of blood. Almond's leg had apparently been torn off. He gave his May West to Reading, then sank away. For the next 18 hours, Reading floated below, kicking at the sharks and hacking at them with his binoculars. By the time a search boat found him, his legs were slashed and his jaw broken by the fin of a shark. But thanks to Almond, he was alive. Almond, who had died at 21, was nominated for a posthumous medal for bravery. Wow, that's incredible, dude. This guy hates me reading here. He's this crazy drug dealer that lives next door. Like I said, it's a really bad neighborhood, and I guess you know, he doesn't like me reading. But everyone had he heard stories like readings, <laughs> and everyone had looked from their planes to see sharks roaming below. The fear of sharks was so powerful that most men, faced with the choice of riding a crippled plane or to, to, to ditching or bailing out, chose to take their chances in ditching, even in the B-24s. At least that would leave them near the rafts. The military was dedicated to finding crash and ditching survivors, but in the sprawling Pacific theater, the odds of rescue were extremely daunting. Many doomed planes sent no distress call, and often no one knew a plane was down until it missed its estimated time of arrival, which could be as long as 16 hours after the crash. If the absence went unnoticed until night, an air search couldn't be commenced until morning. In the meantime, raft-bound men struggled with injuries and exposure and drifted far from their crash site. For rescuers, figuring out where to look was tremendously difficult. To keep radio silence, many crews didn't communicate any position during flights, so all searchers had to go on was the course the plane would have followed had everything gone right. The downed planes had often been flying over huge distances and may have veered hundreds of miles off course. Once a plane was down, currents and wind could carry a raft dozens of miles a day. Because of this, search areas often extended over thousands of square miles. The longer rafts floated, the further they drifted, and the worse the odds of a rescue became. The most heartbreaking fact was that if searchers were lucky enough to fly near a raft, chances were good that they wouldn't see it. Rafts were, were rafts for small planes were the size of small bathtubs. Those for large planes were the length of reclining men. Though a search generally flew at just 1,000 feet, even from the height a raft could easily be mistaken for a white cap or a glint of light. On days with low clouds, nothing could be seen at all. Many planes used for rescue searches had high stall speeds, so they had to be flown so fast that the crewmen barely had a moment to scan each area before it was gone behind them. In mid-1944, in response to the dismal results of Pacific rescue searches, the AAF implemented a vastly enhanced rescue system. Life rafts were stocked with radios and better provisions. Boats were set out along the pass, flown by military planes, and searches were handled by designated rescue squadrons equipped with float planes. These advances improved the odds of a rescue, but even after the advent, most downed men were never found. According to reports made by the Far East Air Force Air Surgeon, fewer than 30% of whose planes went missing July 1944 and February 1945 were rescued. Even when the plane's location was known, only 46 per minute. 
46% of men were saved. In some months, the picture was far worse. In January 1945, only 21 of 167 downed bomber command airmen were rescued, just 13%. As bleak as these odds were late in the war, men who went down before 1944 faced far worse. Flying before the rescue system was modernized, they faced a situation in which searches were discouraged. Life rats poorly equipped and procedures ineffective. Everyone on Phil's crew knew that they should, if they should go down, their chances of rescue were very low. The improbability of a rescue coupled with a soaring rate of accidental crashes created a terrible equation. Search planes appeared to have been more likely to go down themselves than to find the men they were looking for. In one time frame in the Eastern Air Command, half of the Catalina flying boats attempted rescues crashed while attempting to land on the ocean. It seems likely that for every man rescued, several would-be rescuers died, especially in the first years of the war. With every day that passed without rescue, the prospects for the raft-bound men worsened dramatically. Raft provisions lasted a few days at most. Hunger, thirst, and the exposure to blistering sun by day and chill by night depleted survivors with frightening rap rapidity. Some men died in days, others went insane. In September 1942, a B-17 crashed into the Pacific, stranded nine men on a raft. Within a few days, one had died and the rest had gone mad. Two heard music and baying dogs. One was convinced that a Navy plane was pushing the raft from behind. Two scuffled over an imaginary case of beer. Another shouted curses at a sky that he believed was full of bombers. Seeing a delusionary boat, he pitched himself overboard and drowned. On day six, when a plane flew by, the remaining men had to confer to be sure that it was real. <laughs> when they were rescued on day seven, they were too weak to wave their arms. Wow. Like, is that real? I don't know. There were, there were fates even worse than this. In February 1942, a wooden raft was found drifting near Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean. Upon it was the body of a man lying in a makeshift coffin that appeared to have been built on the raft. The man's boiler suit had been in the sun for so long that its blue fabric had been bleached white. A shoe that didn't belong to the man lay beside him. No one ever determined who he was or where he had come from. Of all the horrors facing down men, their one outcome that they feared the most was captured by the Japanese. The roots of the men's fear lay in an event that occurred in 1937 in the early months of Japan, Japan's invasion of China. The Japanese military surrounded the city of Nanking, stranding more than half a million civilians and 90,000 Chinese soldiers. The soldiers surrendered and, assured of their safety, submitted to being bound. Japanese officers then issued a written order, all prisoners of war to be executed. What followed was a six-week frenzy of killing that defies articulation. Masses of POWs were beheaded, machine-gunned, bayoneted, and buried, burned alive. The Japanese turned on civilians, engaging in killing contests, raping tens of thousands of people, mutilating and crucifying them, and provoking dogs to maul them. Japanese soldiers took pictures of themselves posing alongside hacked-up bodies, severed heads, and women strapped down for rape. The Japanese press ran tallies of the killing contests as if they were baseball scores, praising the heroism of the contestants. Historians estimate the Japanese military murdered between 200,000 and 430,000 Chinese, including the 90,000 POWs in what became known as the Rape of Nanking. This horrible uh, thing that happened in human history, the Rape of Nanking. Every American airman knows about Nanking, and since then Japan had only reinforced the precedent. Among the men Louis squadron, there was a rumor circulating about the toll of Kwajijin in the Marshall Islands, a Japanese territory. A Kwajijin, the rumor said, POWs were murdered. The men called it Execution Island. It is testament to the reputation of the Japanese that all of the men and one fatally damaged B-24 falling over Japanese forces, only one chose to bail out. The rest were so afraid of capture that they chose to die in the crash. For airmen, the risks were impossible to shrug off. The dead weren't numbers on a page. They were their roommates, their drinking buddies, the crew that had been flying off the wing ten seconds ago. Men didn't go by one by one. A quarter of barracks was lost at once. There were rarely funerals, for there were rarely bodies. Men were just gone, and that was the end of it. Remember, 50% of them didn't survive. Airmen avoided the subject of death, but privately, many were tormented by fear. One man in Louis' squadron had chronic stress-induced nosebleeds. Another had to be relieved because he froze with terror in the air. Pilot Joe Deasy recalled a distraught airman who came to him with a question. If a crewman went mad during a mission, would the crew shoot him? The man was so jittery that he accidentally fired his sidearm into the ground as he spoke. 
Some men were certain that they'd be killed. Others lived in denial. For Louis and Phil, there was no avoiding the truth. After only two months of one combat mission, five of their friends were already dead, and they had survived several near misses themselves. The room and icebox, inherited from friends whose bodies were now in the Pacific, were constant reminders. Before Louis had left the States, he'd been issued an olive drab Bible. He tried reading it to cope with his anxiety, but it made no sense to him, and he abandoned it. Instead, he soothed himself by listening to classical music on his phonograph. He often left Phil scrawled on his bed, penning letters to Cece on an upturned box as he head, headed off, as he headed out to run off his worries on the mile-long course that he had measured in the sand along the runway. He also tried to prepare for every contingency. He went to the machine shop, cut a thick metal slab, lugged it into Superman, and plucked it down in the greenhouse in hopes that he would protect him from ground fire. He took classes on island survival and wound care and found a course in which an elderly Hawaiian offered tips on fending off sharks. Open eyes wide and bare teeth. Make football-style stiff arm. Bob shark nose in nose. Bob shark in nose. Yeah, that's how you fly off a shark, according to this ancient Hawaiian that taught Louis Zamperini. And like everything else, Louis and Phil drank. After a few beers, Louis said it was possible to briefly forget dead friends. Mm. Men were given a ration of four beers a week, but everyone scoured the landscape for alternatives. Alcohol was to Louis what acorns was to squirrels, and he consumed what he wanted when he found it and hid the rest. In training, he had stashed his hooch in a shaving cream bottle. Once deployed, he graduated to mayonnaise jars and ketchup bottles. He stowed a bottle of local rot gut called Five Island Gin, nicknamed Five Ulcer Gin. In Radio Man Harry Brooks' gas mask holster, when an MP trapped Brooks' head to check for the mask, the bottle broke and left Brooks with a soggy leg. It was probably for the best. Louis noticed that when he drank the stuff, his chest hair spontaneously fell out. He later discovered that Five Island Gin was often used as paint thinner. After that, he stuck to beer. Phil, like all airmen, had to cope with the possibility of dying, but he had an additional burden. As a pilot, he was keenly conscious that he made a mistake. Eight other men could die. He began carrying, if he made a mistake, eight other men could die. He began carrying two talesmen. One was a bracelet Cece, two tail, talesmen's. One was a bracelet Cece had given him, believing that it kept him from harm. He wouldn't go up without it. The other was a silver dollar that jingled endlessly in his pocket. On the day that he finally ran away with Cece, he said he'd use it to tip the bellboy. When I did, when I do get home, he wrote to her, I'm going to hide you where no one will find us. In the early days of 1943, as men died one, another, one after another, every man dealt with the losses in a different way. Somewhere along the way, a ritual sprang up. If a man didn't return, the others would open his footlocker, take out the his liquor, and have a drink in his honor. In war without funerals, it was the best that they could do. That was chapter 8 in Laura Hildenbrandt's great book, Unbroken. Um, I got a little touched up there. Cause, um, you know, the, it's about Louis Zamperini and his best friend is Phil while he's in the Air Force. It's not called the Air Force, the Army Air Force, the AAF. And uh, they have a 50% chance of dying. And Phil's a really great guy. I, he reminds me, you know, like, I, I, like, I, I like Phil a lot. You know, he's a really cool, quiet guy. And um, he has a girlfriend, Cece, and like, he's just like, you know, a decent guy and he's writing love letters to Cece and the way they're foreshadowing it, I really hope he makes it back to her. You know, I know Louie's the main character, but I want Cece and Phil to, you know, like, end up together. I hope they do. But um, uh, that was uh, chapter eight. Uh, my name is Gregory Brandt. Check out my channels and hit the thumbs up. I know this doesn't have any views right now, but that reading was really good. And I had to risk a lot of danger from the people that don't like reading. I'm reading this from Hawaii, where a lot of this book takes place, including the current chapters that we're reading. And um, uh, that, once again, hit the thumbs up button, hit the like button, and also send this to a friend. And uh, thank you.